to one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Husky Hoop Scoop. This is Avon Kidwai, uh, and as usual, I'm here with Dan Connolly, Irina Nanka, and Will Richardson. We're here to talk UConn women's hoops. Uh, the Huskies, since we last spoke, have plowed through the American Athletic Conference tournament field, uh, ending it with an emphatic win, 100-44, against uh, a very solid USF team. Katie Lou Samuelson went 10 for 10 from the three-point line in that game uh, while hitting or tying a number of different records. Uh, and then so far through the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament, they have defeated two upstate New York teams, uh, from the lovely confines of Gamble Pavilion, or not so lovely, maybe. Um, but uh, they beat Albany 116 to 55, and then uh, national championship rematch from 2016, uh, a 30 point win for the Huskies over the Syracuse Orange. A lot of interesting takeaways I think that we can, uh, we can talk about from what we've seen out of the Huskies. Uh, across the conference tournament and in the first two games even of, of the NCAA tournament. Uh, but I think one thing that is, has been really important for UConn uh, as they start to get to those tougher teams, uh, Kia Nurse seems to be doing very, very well coming back from the injury. Uh, your thoughts, Dan? Yeah, I mean, in the American Conference tournament, she was clearly limited. She didn't play more than 20, 25 minutes in every game. She really didn't look fully healthy after that. So she's definitely looked a lot better in the NCAA tournament. And there's something about Monday night tournament games with this team. Two weeks ago, Katie Lou Samuelson goes off at Mohegan in the championship, 10 for 10. And then last night against Syracuse, Kia Nurse goes 9 for 12 from three, just catches fire and just puts on one of the best performances of the season. So that might seem like an outlier, but in the first game against Albany, she went 5 of 7 from deep. So she's clearly back, and as Gino said, they're happy to have her production on offense, but it's it's her defensive ability around the perimeter that's really the biggest key for the Huskies team. I mean, Sanaya Chong is there. Crystal Dangerfield's defense is coming along, so when they need to shut down a guard, Kia Nurse is the one to go to. So it's huge that she's healthy going into the regionals. Yep, looks like she's going to be a, a dangerous two-way player for the Huskies, 29 points. In that Syracuse game, uh, Will, any any uh, additional takeaways from the past few games you'd like to add? Well, I think the interesting thing about Kia Nurse is that she had the ability in the conference tournament to gain a little bit of confidence. You know, you play against teams like USF, and it gives you energy to actually perform when you need to perform. And Dan mentioned that she had 24 in the first game of the tournament. She had 29 in this game, and she just looked completely unstoppable. At the halftime, Gino mentioned that Kia Nurse was going to be the key for that game, and though her scoring performance dropped tremendously in the second half, she hit a bank three-pointer in the corner that she didn't even think was going to go in. And once it went in, you could see the whole team rally around that. So Kia Nurse has been, you know, her well, her return has been one of the spark plugs for this team. But what I really liked from last game was that Gabby Williams had a really good under-the-rug game that a lot of people didn't really catch. She had 23 points, six rebounds, five assists, two blocks, and two steals. Now, anytime you can fill up the stat sheet like that is one thing. But to do it in the game where Nafisa also has 17 and Katie Lou has 23 as well, that says a lot about the depth of this team. And it says a lot about the fact that Gabby Williams is going to be possibly the player that I'm going to be looking at moving forward for the rest of the games. Yeah, Gabby's obviously prone to to stuffing the stat sheet. We've seen it all season. Uh, amazingly fun player to see on the court. Uh, so uh, hard to argue there, though. Obviously, there's a lot of other talent on the roster. Uh, Irina, any other takeaways you'd like to add from the the first two rounds? Um, in the the Albany game, they came off to a slow start. Some some harsh words, which you would one would think would be tough to find after a 61 point defeat. However, he was concerned about their defense. And I think that they responded 
in the Syracuse game, not necessarily in the manner that he would have been happy with. They had fewer rebounds. They had fewer overall defensive successes despite Kia Nurse playing phenomenally. She wasn't able to light up the defensive side of this team that I know that Gino is going to be giving them a hard time about fit coming up in the, the Sweet 16. And then, Dan, do you have something else? <laughs> Sorry, I missed the transition on that. Um, do I have something else? Yeah, wasn't there something? We can obviously cut this. Um, wasn't there something we were going to end this conversation with that you had mentioned? Oh, Syracuse being a good rival rivalry situation. Oh, I thought that was at the end end. No, no, no. It was at the end of this oh, conversation. Okay. So you can just go into that any old time. Take some, take a second since we're breaking. Compose your thoughts, and then just add it like it's another thing, and we'll we'll plop it in there. And isn't it more fun beating Syracuse? I mean, come on. Obviously, the men's rivalry is what what it's known for. But anytime UConn's beating Syracuse, whether it's in basketball, women's basketball, football, club soccer, come Field on, hockey. it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely agree, and I think it'll be it'll be good for the game of uh, of college women's college basketball to have uh, a regional rav rivalry brewing. Uh, I think you know it was it was discussed in women's basketball circles. Syracuse was a bit underseeded as an eight, uh, so they are a, a good team that's building something. They have a good coach. Um, they have uh, the propensity to to succeed. So um, you know. Good to have, and, and maybe hopefully down the road they can get a series scheduled, uh, even though they wouldn't accommodate that for Brianna Stewart in her senior year. So uh, more fuel to the fire, uh, as if we needed any in the rivalry between UConn and Syracuse. Um, we're going to move on now to a discussion about the Sweet 16. So uh, the Huskies will be taking on UCLA in their – 24th straight Sweet 16 appearance. Uh, they've got, uh, they'll be playing that in Bridgeport on Saturday at 2 p.m. Will, uh, you've seen UCLA play a couple times. You've, you've taken a look at, uh, at what they've been doing. What, what, what's, the, what's the lowdown on this UCLA team? Well, I think one of the interesting things about this UCLA team is that they haven't really gotten a lot of coverage in terms of the national media. What I mean by national media is the fact that games that are normally on ESPN or ESPN2, you typically don't really see them that much on because of the Pac-12 network. So this team is a 25-8 and eight team on the year. They score about 74, 75 points per game, and they only give up 62, 63. So they're pretty solid, and every game that they win, they win pretty handily by double digits. So that's one of the things to look forward to. The second thing I'm looking forward to is that UCLA has three players that are pretty dominant scoring the ball, not so much to UConn's level, but on the national level as a whole. You have their star point guard, Jordan Canada. She scored 17.8 points per game. She shoots 83% from the free throw line, so she gets into the paint. She could be very dangerous against the Huskies. Then you have um, Monique Billings. She scores about 17 a game as well. And then you have Kennedy Burke. She averages about 12. So if you put those three players together, they can give UConn a lot of trouble. The first game of their tournament, they won by 27. The second game, they won by 32. So if you're looking at a matchup for a team that UConn doesn't normally see that often and is a really good team on paper and on the court as well, this is the matchup. They did face off a couple of years back. UConn won that game by 30 or so when they had uh, Brianna Stewart, Morgan Tuck, and Mariah Jefferson on the team. So it's not like UCLA isn't entirely unfamiliar with UConn, but UConn has Sanai Chong, Gabby, and Kia that have all played them. So that's something I'm looking forward to for this coming up, uh, coming up game on Saturday. Excuse me. Irina, uh, thoughts on the UCLA matchup? Sorry, is that for me? Yep, yep. I couldn't I, hear you. Yeah, I said your name. Okay. It's okay. It, it broke um, up. For the UCLA matchup, I, I think it's very interesting 
that this is only their second Sweet 16 since 1999. You associate UCLA and basketball, and I had the assumption prior to doing my diligence on them that they would have gone to more Sweet 16s in that time span. This is only their fifth overall. Um, and as Will mentioned, we had played them previously. We won by, by over 30 points. But I do think that it's going to be a, a tougher game for them defensively than they think it is when you had one of your guards scoring seven, seven shots from behind the three-point line. I understand that that's not nine, but your defense is going to have to prevent that type of play. Hope that in their, their practices this week, Gino drilled that home to them because if not, they're going to have a closer game than they may expect to have. Dan? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of hard not to look right past UCLA, but like Irina said, just like with Syracuse, it's good to have two basketball schools come together. But let's be honest, this is really just going to be a tune-up for the ultimate battle against Maryland. Yeah, I mean, hard, hard to think that this UCLA team is going to be much more than a, um, you know, a, a road bump for, uh, for the Huskies. But you do bring up an interesting point, Dan. Uh, this Maryland team definitely represents a threat. They were also underseeded. I uh, talk about a couple teams in our, in our bracket who are uh, underseeded. Maryland is a three seed, very interesting decision. Uh, many believed the Terrapins to be a top five team in the country. So surprising to see them listed as a third, uh, a three seed. They'll uh, have a chance if they win their Sweet 16 game to play the Huskies in the Elite Eight. And they did give UConn over even the past, let's call it the past two years, they've been the toughest opponent UConn has faced over the past two years. They came fairly close last year uh, and really, really close this year uh, in their arena. So uh, UConn will have an advantage because the games in Bridgeport they're still the more talented team, but this Maryland team could could be a threat to to uh, UConn's myriad streaks that are on the line. Uh, that would be on the line uh, in an Elite Eight game. Thoughts on the matchup with Maryland? Yeah, I mean, since that last game in December, I've been saying that Maryland is not only the uh, toughest matchup for UConn, but I really think they're the only team that's got a chance to beat UConn. Everyone said that, oh, Baylor can beat UConn, South Carolina can beat UConn, Notre Dame on a good day, but South Carolina lost one of their best players. North Notre Dame lost one of their best players. Baylor, I just don't feel like they have the firepower to do it. When UConn played Maryland, they went up by double digits multiple times in that game, including in the second half. And Maryland roared back and when they were making that second push at the end of the game, I, I'm not going to lie, I felt like Maryland was going to win that game. I thought they were going to take the streak down right there, and somehow UConn squeezed it out. So in all likelihood, when these two teams meet in the Elite Eight, it's going to be one of the best games in women's college basketball. Maybe not this year, but it, for the last couple of years, it's going to be a just heavyweight battle to the end. Well, um, you know, we, I, I definitely agree. Definitely will be a, a big time matchup. Will, who are the standout players on Maryland? We've heard a lot about Destiny Slocum. Uh, they've got some other really good players, but um, who who are their uh, kind of main forces on that team? Well, you mentioned one in Destiny Slocum. The other two are Shatori Walker Kimbrough, who is a guard that can definitely create her own shot. Maybe if you want to say Kelsey Plum would be the model point guard that can shoot. Shatori Walker Kimbrough's not too far from Kelsey Plum. So she's definitely dangerous. And plus she's faced UConn three times in the postseason. Well, twice in the postseason and once in the regular season. So she has the experience needed to take down a team like UConn. And then you have Brianna Jones, a player who a lot of people were expecting to see on a ESPNW first team this year. She was on the second team. So she's definitely a center that can do anything inside the paint. She's strong, she's athletic, she can get to the rim, and she can shoot that mid-range jump shot as well. And plus, on top of all of that, you have an angry Brenda Freeze. You have a, a coach who feels really under-respected by everybody, 
I personally thought they were a one seed, maybe a two seed, but the fact that they're a three seed in UConn's division and have to play at Bridgeport and you have the ammunition of this team beating you guys the last time you went to the Final Four, it's not it's not something you want to see if you're a slacking UConn. So UConn's going to definitely have to bring it on all ends of the court, offense and defense, play calling, everything. And they're going to have to be on the same page because, like Dan said, Maryland may be the only team left that has all of their pieces left that can actually beat UConn. Irina, how, how threatened do you feel by uh, by the possibility of Maryland beating UConn in the Elite Eight? To piggyback off of what Will said, all of that ammunition that Maryland feels that they're going to have to throw against UConn, I think his team for a battle royale with all of that ammunition, knowing full well that this Maryland team is going to come into Bridgeport with all they've got ready to attack and his Huskies are ready to fight back. I think they're going to be more prepped to fight back on the Maryland side of the game than they will be for UCLA in the Sweet 16. They are going to go into that Maryland game, and I think they're going to win in double digits, give them a loss bigger than what they gave them earlier in the season, and show the rest of the field that loss to UConn, but they're going to lose in a much more major way because these girls want to win. They want to prove themselves in a way that we haven't had other UConn teams in, in recent history have to evidence at yeah. this, at this the, level. I mean, there are some reasons to believe that can happen. The the game this season, at least, that was really close. Katie Lou Samuelson was sick. Um, I know she had a really good game, but she was sick, not at her best, um, which, as we know from a few games very recently, uh, is a very, very high ceiling that she does have. So there's that. And, of course, this game, the, the that regular season meeting this year was – uh, at the Xfinity Center in College Park. So this being at Bridgeport, effectively a home, a home crowd for UConn. Uh, I, I think there are reasons to believe that, that UConn could win comfortably, but um, for all of the other reasons that we discussed, they are also the biggest threat that probably exists in the field. Um, Will, thoughts on some other teams who might be uh, – on that list uh, from other regions who, who've either been, who either have had a good, really, you know, really great regular season or uh, have looked particularly good in the tournament? Well, just looking at some of the matchups that you would have going into Friday and Saturday, you have Ohio State with Kelsey Mitchell, who played UConn this year and played great against UConn this year. I would love to see Ohio State UConn matchup again. Notre Dame without Brianna Turner's big. Washington, Kelsey Plum, and Osator, Chantal Osator, that's a great team to watch as well. You can't go wrong with a lot of the teams that are still in the field, but my three teams that I'm looking forward to the most, I would probably have to say Washington, Texas, because they've been fairly inconsistent all year, but when they play well, they are a really hard team to beat. And Washington, those are those are the three teams I'm looking forward to. And kind of a side note team would be Quinnipiac, you know, being being a Connecticut guy per se. You know, the story of Quinnipiac upsetting Marquette, who made it to the Big East final, and upsetting Miami, who was a solid ACC team all year, on their home court and demolishing them in the process. That's a team to look forward to, too. So my four, I'll change it to four. It's a Quinnipiac, Ohio State, Texas, Washington. Those are, those are the four that most basketball fans should look forward to seeing. All right, good stuff. Uh, while all of this has been going on, in the world of women's college basketball. Uh, HBO has been running a documentary series on this year's uh, Huskies. They have the pleasure of a uh, very fun group of girls, uh, great people, always very open. And um, you can tell, obviously, they have a lot of fun together. And then, of course, the the star of the show, Gina Oriema. I can only assume, actually, I haven't even seen the show uh, because um, – real life, but um, Gino Ariema, I mean, you, you give that guy unfiltered airtime, uh, you're guaranteed gold. So, Irina, I know you've had a chance to, to stay on top of the documentary series on HBO. What have I missed? What's What's been good? And uh, what have been some of your, your highlights from the show? You, ha you have to watch this documentary. It opens up 
Hawk's Barn Hill, entering through Husky Village. Everything that you've ever known and loved about Yukon is everything that you're shown that are a few years out of Yukon get to enjoy through the courtesy of HBO's highly technology that they provide for us is great. Lee Schreiber is the narrator of the series. Going to their new facility, which is unbelievable. It's beautiful. Gino watches every single championship. He goes through videos of every, every game. It's incredible. That's what the first episode focuses on and how this, the teams deal with the pressure and the expectations that are placed on a program like UConn basketball. It's, it's incredible. The second episode enters the AAC conference tournament. They're at Mohegan Sun. Katie Lou is going out to dinner with her dad and gets standing ovations in restaurants there. It is, it's an emotional experience for the, the players and for Gino. It's absolutely beautiful. My favorite episode so far has been the third episode, with the line of the series, I think, from Gino, which is, I hope my mom doesn't have HBO because he was cooking some home-cooked chicken parm or whatever it was that he was making, and he was concerned his mother would watch and have commentary. It was truly much to, to watch a guy like that and to hear how he, he really harps on these women who are the best players in the country and the best at what they do, that they need to just give their all. They need to put more effort. They need to put more teamwork. They need to play selflessly with each other. It's, it's a lesson that maybe I'm happy that every other coach in college basketball, both men and women's, hasn't watched yet because if they do catch on to the way that he teaches these girls how to play, the world is in a lot of trouble, i.e. our UConn bubble world of women's basketball. It's not, it's not magic. There's no formula that anybody else can't pick up on. They just work harder than everybody else, and they have an attitude that is evident in the film in the way that they, they show these girls living their lives and, and the way that they play together as a team and do everything. And I highly recommend this show for not only UConn basketball fans, not only that have that are aspiring to play UConn women's basketball or basketball anywhere, but any individual who, who looks for some sort of sense of leadership in, in, in sports that you don't see often. There's, there aren't many programs that have head coaches or athletic directors or you know, players on the professional level that stay for their entire careers. And that is what he has done in stores. And it is a... Well, I, I do have to say, you had me at chicken parm. Uh, I, I would love <laughs> to, uh, I would actually love to see Gino making a chicken parm. So you've sold me. Um, I know you guys have had a chance to see some of the episodes. Any other uh, highlights that you guys had? Yeah, I saw the first episode and I've seen the trailers for the two. The first episode I thought was awesome. I mean, it's, it's just an awesome look inside the world of UConn basketball. The second episode, um, fun story, I, I got to see that one pretty much firsthand because my spot at the second day of the AAC tournament was directly behind the HBO guy, the cameraman. So uh, I was trying to watch the game through him, so I'll have to go uh, watch the documentary to see what I missed from behind him during the game. But the third uh, trailer, I mean, that's just peak Gino. He's going through his family photo, and he says, uh, you're supposed to look miserable. I mean, if you smile, you get shot on sight. That is just peak Gino. I mean, because the best part is, like, the way he says it, you kind of take him seriously for, like, a split second. You're like, wow, life in Italy was that bad? But then you realize he's kidding. And uh, he's great. I love him. I think the interesting thing about the documentary is for somebody who worked with the UConn team and got to watch players develop on the court and off the court – it gives me a second perspective as to be able to say, this is exactly what I saw working these games, being around the team, and even getting to know them off the court. It's the same exact thing. And UConn is one of the few programs in the country, we've, we've talked about it before, where they have the popularity and the visibility to be able to pull off a show like this, this well. For myself, Dan and Amon and Arena, we know Gino as that lovable, very sarcastic, blunt and upfront guy. We've seen it, so we know it. 
And not, there's not many things that Gino can say that will catch us off guard. But seeing Gino make a chicken parm, chicken parmesan, that, that's the type of things that we don't necessarily get to see. So for the fact that the layman's at home, if that's a term I can use, the layman people that are at home that don't have easy access to the program can watch this team and say, wow, they are normal coaches. They are normal players. There's nothing special about what they're doing, but they have a system that works. Why can't we? And maybe that hopefully will lead to a future generation of players that will, you know, raise the bar. But I love the show. I love the direction it's going in. These NCAA tournament episodes, once they release, they're going to be fantastic. But I'm, I'm loving the show and everything that Gino and his women are bringing to the forefront. Yeah, I think the you know you guys you guys hit on it at various points, but I think uh, the what Gino has been able to do with with the way he's built the program is take obviously some of the best players in the country, but more importantly, convince them to play the team version of basketball uh, and and uh, dedicate themselves to playing defense, be selfless on the court, and. Um, you know, I think something else that that he had mentioned recently was about was about the passing uh, that that they were just moving the ball incredibly well. I think they had something like thirty one assists 30 on. Assists. Go yeah, for it! Go for it! Thirty assists on thirty three baskets, and for a while it was thirty assists on thirty one baskets. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, you know, to to get to get people who are not just you know the best in their high school or even just the best in their state. They're among the, the 10 or 15 best players in the whole country, uh, usually when they, when they arrive at UConn. And, um, you know, usually you don't tell those, that caliber of player, you're not going to see the court until you dedicate yourself to playing defense. Um, Gino obviously has a very powerful position, especially in that lovely practice facility, to uh, show them the, uh, the banner proof that, uh, his system works, but even so, it's very difficult to do. And and I think that's one of the most Im- that's the most impressive part of the team. I think um, something that 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 underlies his entire process, and that I've seen from other uh, television documentary series from S and Y uh, that that really highlighted that for me. Um, uh, well, to your point that he can point up and just say, look at the banners and look at what I can do. It's not just he can say, look at the banners. It's he's actively recruiting players where he doesn't need to say that. I mean, I've, I talked to players about uh, different things throughout the year about following up. Like during the streak, I was talking about what they thought of the older players that started the first streak. And I believe it was Sanaya Chong. She turns around and she didn't point to the banners, but she pointed to all the All-Americans that they have also on the wall. And she says, I mean, I have to play with my game up to the level of all these players because of what they built. So it's not just Gino, it's the players motivating themselves too. And what you've seen this year with the players too reminds me, not even a little, a lot of the 2010-2011 men's basketball team with the way that they rally around Gabby Williams, Kemba, she's, she leads their team off the court. More so, not more so, but off the court as much as she does on the court. She's cooking them home-cooked meals in her apartment. She's bringing them together to do all the same things that Kemba did with that team, which brought them a level above their competition. Okay, talent-wise, they were undefeated, but that level of camaraderie, and brotherhood, sisterhood, the, the spirit of the players that they want to do this. This isn't Gino telling the girls, you need to go to Gabby Williams' house for dinner every night. She wants to cook for them. She enjoys hanging out with them. They all do things together. They've built a bond that's bigger than just on the court, and it's translated to this success that we're seeing in this incredible run this season. Yeah, and I, and I think another thing, too, that's interesting about the documentary and about the way that the team has been playing this year is there's a video going around on Facebook and Twitter from the Final Four last year, and it's Gino talking about the approach that he takes when it comes to players that are not in the game 
sitting on a bench and whether or not they can actually play or not. And he made the quote, and it's a, it's a two-minute video, so if you haven't seen it, I recommend that you find it and watch it because it's really good. And in it, he basically says, if a player's body language doesn't look good, if she's, on, if she's asleep on the bench, if she's not looking like she's contributing anything to the team, I will not play you. He brought up the fact of benching Stewart, uh, Breonna Stewart for 35 minutes in a game last year. And he said, you know, the controversy I got was that I was preparing her for the game against South Carolina. And that wasn't the case at all. If it was the South Carolina game, I would have done the same exact thing. So you get to see a coach willing to put himself forefront and say, look, I'm not the reason for any of this. We just have a standard. We have a system. You either buy into it or you don't. If you don't buy into it, you just won't play and you won't be a part of the team. So the fact that you can rally Gabby Williams around everybody else speaks almost as much to the staff, you know, with uh, Marissa Mosley, CD, and Shay Ralph, as much as it does about Geno. So if you haven't seen that video, I recommend that you watch it. If you haven't seen the documentary, watch it too. Amon, you got to get on that. We know you're kind of old, but I'm going to need you to do a little bit better. I'm doing so, so many things you don't even know. You don't even know. IRS, 401Ks. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but well, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I definitely, I definitely will get on that for sure. And and I do agree. It's it's something I, I really enjoy is always getting that behind the scenes look at at those who are truly great at what they do. Um, so be sure to watch the HBO show. Uh, watch the SNY documentaries that they've uh, that they did across the past two years. They did a really good one this season on. Um, on this year's team's preseason performance. Uh, and then they did one last year on the 95 team, the one that broke through for that first title, both extremely good stories. Um, and so those are definitely all, all worth watching. Uh, and then make sure to watch them play. They'll be, uh, they'll be going up against UCLA on Saturday. And then... On Monday, the 27th, they will play most likely Maryland uh, in the Elite Eight. So uh, that's going to do it for us today. For Dan, Irina, and Will, this is Amon Kidwide. Thank you all for watching.